Well, I know he's busy as can be. I want to thank Chairman Paul Ryan of the Budget Committee in the House. How are you, sir? Hey, great one. How are you doing? I'm doing great, brother. Now, tell me what, you know, this budget the president is proposing sounds like a real stinker to me. Why is that? <laughs> well, because it has a $1.6 trillion tax increase, doubles the debt in five years, triples it in ten years. <clears throat> he adds $13 trillion, uh, to the debt over the course of his budget. Uh, borrow, spend, tax, and uh, does nothing. Let me repeat that. Does nothing to address the drivers of our debt. He actually adds to the problem. You know, I find it kind of incredulous. Literally, I was expecting something different. I really actually was expecting, you know, given that the president formed the fiscal commission, told us I was on the fiscal commission, told us we have a serious problem, we've got to deal with it, let's go forward. Uh, he didn't even put any of the fiscal commission, commission recommendations in here. His spending levels on just discretionary spending are way above what was recommended by the fiscal commission. And the fiscal commission was stacked with Democrats. So he's to the left of his fiscal commission. He's not addressing the debt and deficit crisis. And what this does for economic growth is this costs us jobs. I mean, today's deficits is tomorrow's tax increases and interest rate increases. And so he really is just doubling down on the path he took the last two years. And candidly, I thought we were going to see a little bit of a, what they call a triangulation, a little moderation after the last election. And unfortunately, he decided not to do that. And he's just basically doubling down on where he, where he went the last two years. Well, well let, let me ask you something, because, you know, he's not a stupid man. Nope. I, know he's in, I know he's ideologically uh, <clears throat> driven. But that said, you know, we all have kids. You know, one day we'll have grandkids. This is such an incomplete, unconscionable disaster. I mean... This is really a generational problem. Even though our generation is going to get hammered hard, the next generation is right. going to have no way out. How can we as a society get our hands around this when the most powerful man in the country continues to plow ahead in the wrong direction? So there's two answers you get to that kind of a statement or question. One is he's waiting for us to do something. Okay, he's the president of the United States. I mean, that's why we elect presidents, to lead to actually see the challenges and address them before they get out of control. Um, and number two, he knows we're going to do something. He knows that we're serious about the debt, and he knows we're going to go after the drivers of the debt, which is entitlement reform. And so many people think he's playing what they call rope-a-dope, where you know, we're going to go forward with the reforms that are necessary to get this debt and deficit under control to restrict the growth of government, and that he'll demagogue us in the campaign about it. He'll use this as a way to you know, sort of scare seniors and turn entitlement reform into a political weapon as a means to 2012, you know, politics. Now, a lot of political people will tell you that's a good idea, uh, that it has worked, it has been effective. And so perhaps that's what he's doing. He walk into his so-called political trap by proposing the reforms that are necessary to get the deficit and debt under control. I would simply tell you, the sooner you do this, the better off everybody is. The more you kick the can down the road, which we're already running out of road, the worse it is for everybody. And by not doing anything to deal with his debt or making it worse, as his budget does, that means everybody's going to get hurt that much harder, cuts to current seniors, tax increases on everybody even more down the road by not tackling it now, uh, just like what you see happening in Europe. But I think, you know, either he's not leading and he's waiting for somebody else to lead, or he's banking on us to do the leading and he's going to use it against us politically. Either those two explanations, what I've heard all day today, are really ugly explanations. That's that's an abdication of leadership. Well, well I, 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 but, but the point is it's intentional. The point is what he's doing is intentional. It's a political expedient. And some, so when somebody writes that he means well, he's trying to do the right thing, what he's doing here is a disaster. And, you know, even his own party, Kent Conrad came out and said, this isn't enough. Yeah. Uh, others are saying, well, it's a good start. He hasn't put forward a serious budget. I mean, Erskine Bowles, who is Bill Clinton's chief of staff, uh, a great Democrat, by the way, uh, a sincere guy, who was the chairman of the Fiscal Commission, said this doesn't get anywhere close to where we need to go to deal with the debt crisis. It's not a serious budget. So I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not going to get into, you know, motives. I don't know why he's doing what he's doing, but what he is doing is he's giving us a budget that makes our fiscal crisis worse, that punts on the biggest domestic crisis, arguably, in the history of our country, a debt crisis, and um, he's advocating his leadership role, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, Chairman, the other thing he's doing is he is he's going after, through regulations, the productive sector. Yeah. 
that creates jobs and wealth. He's going after the oil companies and the coal mines. He's going, he's going after small business. He's going after all these entities yep. that are already scared about investing, that many of them can't invest. They don't have the funds, and he's going to punish them. Mark, I live in Wisconsin. We, we milk cows. We make cheese. Um, now the EPA wants to regulate spilt milk on dairy farms as yep, an we, oil spill. I'm not even making this stuff up. No, I mean, we talked about this. It's stunning. Have? Yeah, so where I come from, I mean, if you kick over a bucket of milk or you, you know, the milk truck jackknifes because we have icy roads, that is now a whole new regulatory process that has to be regulated based on oil spills. I mean, this, this and it, and all these farmers are really freaking out about it. Okay, what is, what is this going to cost me now? What are all these new rules and regulations I've got to comply with? You can go through every business sector you know you can think of, and you see more government, more uncertainty, higher taxes, higher interest rates. And that's why a budget like this, borrow, tax, spend, regulate, um, with the notion that we can sort of micromanage the economy from Washington, um, it's a fatal conceit. It doesn't work. Uh, we've proven that in history, not only in this country but around the world. And um, unfortunately, it's going to cost us a lot of jobs. I mean, there's... Well, here... Here is his political mistake. This isn't 10 years ago. The American people know damn well what's going on with this spending. That's what I think, too. They don't like it. They're scared to death of it. And they're going to come out to the polls again if he, if he say, you know, $5 trillion in three years? I mean, that is absolutely mind-boggling to me. That's what I think, too. Look, the way I try to say it is people are way ahead of the political class. They, You know, up here in Washington, and I'm calling you from the Capitol right now, they think – that the same old story, you know, running Medicare and Social Security scare ads to scare seniors, which, by the way, un under all of Wait, wait, wait. Forms. Don't get mad at me. I have a hard break. Don't hang up, okay? I need yeah. you a few more minutes. Can okay. I keep you a few more minutes? Sure. I apologize. We have a hard break. Right, Mr. Producer? Yeah, there it is. That's the music. We'll be right back. Well, we have America's Paul Ryan, chairman of the House Budget Committee. Now, Chairman Ryan, the, the Obama technique is obvious now. It is... To, to kind of cobble together these broad bills and then throw them at Congress and see what Congress comes up with. Is that, is, and, and that way he can take credit for whatever he wants to take credit for and attack whatever he wants to attack. I, I yeah. think that's what he and his advisors are up to. Send a budget that uses you know various smoke and mirrors to suggest you're doing one thing that rhetorically allows you to sort of mouth words of fiscal discipline when what you're actually doing in substance is quite the opposite. So... I guess you could say we have a rhetorical triangulation, but substantively we have a very, very big government liberal budget in this case. Uh, and so we hear the rhetorical policy pronouncements, but when you see the substance of, of what's behind it, it's just the same old stuff. And so with our budget here, I mean, he is basically proposing to continue on the borrowing binge. He's proposing more investments, which is just really spending, um, as the method – and the reason, the way we get economic growth, and then he wants to follow up with a slug of new taxes that he's proposing, 1.6 trillion, uh, followed by more spending that's above that, um, and then really no no control of the deficit and the debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that's just a complete abdication of leadership. And even Democrats are now criticizing him. Centrist Democrats, you know, like guys like Erskine Bowles, Ellis Rivlin, they're all basically saying, um, you know, this budget doesn't fly. Well. You know, the president has access to a lot more information than even you do. So, so people, I, I mean, is it just that he has surrounded himself with yes men and yes women, or he's just driven ideologically? I don't know. I think ideology has a lot to it. Um, there was reports in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times that they were having a debate about whether to offer up a Social Security reform plan, and the progressives went nuts, and so they didn't do that. Um, so... You could you could suggest that they just have chosen to stay tethered to the progressive left. Um, I think the president, obviously, yeah. I mean, I, th I think he would probably say this to you. He's a progressive. Uh, he believes that. And if you're going to um, get this deficit under control, you're going to do it by getting at the cause of it, which is spending. And if you're going to go after spending, then you're sort of undoing the progressive, you know, experiment. You're undoing the progressive agenda. And I just don't think he's interested in presiding over an undoing of the progressive agenda. Considering he advanced it as far as he did. Yeah, now, I mean, we have all, all kinds of taxes here. He obviously wants to uh, eliminate the Bush tax cuts. Right. He wants to, uh, which includes increasing capital gains, dividends rates. So that's for retired people. He wants right. to uh, 
raise the death tax from 35 to 45 percent right. under certain circumstances. Right. And uh, uh, let's see here. Um, he wants to cap itemized deductions at the 28 right. percent bracket. What does that mean? That means you can't, as you get up to the higher income tax brackets, you're denied the ability to de- to use deductions. So yeah, but but 28 percent is not the highest tax rate. No, 39.6 will be the highest tax bracket. So, so is this like the third? Yeah, so yeah, it is. So there's a 31 percent bracket, there's a 35 percent bracket, then you know in in two years there'll be the 39.6 percent bracket, and then when the new Medicare, uh, Obamacare taxes kick in, the top tax rate in America will be 44.8 percent. When you factor in all of these things, the, we call that the pep and the peas, which you're talking about. Yeah. So 48 44.8% will be the top tax bracket, which is uh, what the sub S chapter corporations pay, the partnerships pay, the vast majority of small businesses file their taxes as individuals. The dividends tax will be 44.8%. The capital gains tax will be 23.8%, up from 15%. Um, and then he's calling for a new $435 billion um, transportation gas tax. Uh, and he's calling for an, an increase in unemployment contributions. Right. So, so it's tough to keep track of all of this. I realize when you add it all up, uh, a conservative estimate using his numbers, it's 1.6 trillion in new tax increases over this 10 years. Um, he's still adding a lot to the debt. The debt doubles in five years and triples in 10 years uh, since he took office, and so the debt is on, on the wrong trajectory. It's going up dramatically. Uh, the gross debt, which is what uh, international comparisons are used, goes to over 100% of the economy by the end of the, uh, the the budget window, by the end of the decade. And so no plan to get this debt. Wait, before, before we go on, that means we are flat out a debtor nation, right? Yeah, I mean, you exceed. When you owe more than you make as a country, you're there. And mm-hmm. the gross debt, uh, and some people use different statistics, but this is what the IMF uses to compare country to country, you know, Greece to Ireland to to China to America, that gross debt number goes to 107 percent of GDP, and I think it's going to be much higher once the CBO takes a look at this thing, because what they're they're predicting kind of what I would call rosy economic scenarios. Um, they're predicting much higher economic growth. The year in which all those tax increases you and I just mentioned, when mm-hmm. they're fully kicked in in 2013, they're expecting the, the economy is going to start taking off then, and then that will give us all these new revenues. Uh, to, to make the deficit look a little bit better than what it would otherwise look like. Well, not, and not to confuse people, but if we follow the Milton Friedman rule with this QE2 stuff going yeah. on, that's about when inflation's going to Yeah, I think that's, I, I agree with that school of thought. Uh, so Milton Friedman also said today's deficits are nothing more than tomorrow's tax increases. They're just deferred taxes. And so this is what businesses see. This is what entrepreneurs see. This is what, you know, banks who are financing businesses see. They see Massive deficits, massive borrowing, no end in sight is going to be another tax increase tomorrow on top of the ones that are already coming in law with much higher interest rates because if we don't get this debt under control, interest goes up. We have to pay people more to lend us money. And then the Federal Reserve, you know, we can go on and on about that. And so to to suggest that we're going to have all these low interest rates forever uh, with fast economic growth, I just think is, you know, it it ignores the obvious. I'll tell you what's upsetting to me is... Worst case scenario from my point of view, the man could be there six more years and he'll be gone and all this stuff will be etched in granite at that point because it's going to be very hard to reverse.